Alva, I have spent my entire adult life seeking the solution to consciousness, in fact, even before my adult life, and went into brain science, and, and have followed over the decades the progress of the field, and have been increasingly impressed with what neuroscientists call the neural correlates of consciousness, specific things that occur in the brain that we can see that directly correspond to conscious perceptions. You somehow disagree with this, and, and it seems like you're swimming against the tide, the tide of scientific history. Why do you do that? I don't dispute that there are neural correlates of consciousness if by that one means changes in brain states that correlate to changes in our states of consciousness. Uh, the question is whether brain states provide the sufficient resources for making sense of the phenomena of consciousness, whether we can uh, unpack the secrets that interest us just by looking at the firing of brain cells. What, is, what there is absolutely unanimity about right now is that at the current time, we do not know, we don't even have uh, a hint as to how it is that the actions of brain cells alone make for the consciousness. Now, I think there's a lot of, of, of puzzles in this area. Let me ask you this. Um, if you were to look inside the brain, and, and, and find, you know, the holy grail is finally in reach. Here it is, the neural correlate of consciousness. How would you know you'd found it? What is it about it which is going to tell you that, aha, now explanation stops? Well, I think if you, if you ask that question to some of the, the champions of this approach, they'll say, well, this is the structure whose occurrence is necessary and sufficient for consciousness. Do they mean that if you cut it out of the brain and somehow activated it in a Petri dish, you'd have that memory of that wine I drank in 1986 in a Petri dish? That would be an absurd view that I find ludicrous, the suggestion that we now know that to be true. We don't now know, now know that to be true. We know that um, neural activity makes consciousness necessary, but it turns out that there's a bunch of stuff required that isn't neural uh, for for enabling consciousness to occur at all. What could possibly be part of consciousness that is not represented in, in some way by neural or brain activity? Well, represented is, is, a, uh, is a troubling word there. Um, Deliberately so. Yeah, but it's troubling because I'm, I'm the burden is on people who want to use that word, there is a burden to explain why that's the word you're looking for. It's not, it's not an animal's job to reconstruct the world in mind. We have evolved in a world that is always already there for us. Mama is always already there for me. This table is here for me now. I don't need to calculate based on little bits of data available at my retinal surface what the properties of this table are. If I want to know what the underside of the table is like, I need only look. And my practical understanding that all I need to do is look now is, is enough to make it the case that now the table is there for me. So um, I, d I just don't really know, right, quite know what it means to say that um, uh, the brain represents. That's one of those words that's just used you know, we've been very careful in our conversation to define our terms, but that's a term that's very difficult to define, and many of the scientists and philosophers who use it don't always define it. For example, one way in which a neuron might represent something else is that that something else causes it to fire. Yes. Okay, so that's, that would be a straightforward yes. forward way. Um, well, all sorts of things happen in the brain as a causal effect of things that we encounter in the world. Um, my point is that if we want to understand human experience, the qualities and features of the world as we know it, we're going to have to look to the world as well as to those brain cells. How does this relate to the so-called computational theory of mind, that basically human consciousness can be replicated in some future technology, maybe not so far off in the future, on uh, silicon or in some sort of quantum computer? that that the same kind of consciousness that we have today can emerge in non-biological intelligence. You see, the, the trick is what is it that we're trying to duplicate? 
What, what is it? You, we, we say consciousness. Well, let's get, let's get into more details. What are the functions? A sense of self-awareness. Let me start with that. N not a reaction. You can program a reaction, a black box, and you have some yeah. afferent input and some output, and you, you can make that the same as what, what you and I would do. But, but trying to imagine, I'm not sure how we would know it's, right. it's there, but right. that's a separate issue. But right. can we, in non-biological intelligence, in, in so any type mm -hmm. of matter, generate, create this feeling of self-awareness? That's right. Yeah. I mean, the truth in the computational view, and there's a lot of truth in it, the truth, what, uh, another term for this is functionalism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the truth in this view is that there's nothing magical about the stuff we're made of, right? right? So it's not, you, there's, nowhere are we allowed to peel for magic. If we want to understand how what's going on inside us is contributing to our consciousness, we need to ask ourselves, what jobs is the stuff inside of us doing? What's the functional interconnection uh -huh. between the different parts of the brain, between the, different, the brain and the different parts of the body? Um, and and if you, can, if you can abstractly characterize the functional organization, then in principle, you can realize those functions in different material. Just if you substituted every molecule of one type for a mo with a molecule of a different type, maybe you could preserve function. Um, I think that's an important, an important uh, question to ask. And this, this whole reverse engineering question, try to understand ourselves by thinking about how we would engineer ourselves if we were to start from scratch, is, I think, a very fruitful fruitful uh, way to go about it. And I think there's tremendous insight in the whole AI, um, artificial, artificial intelligence. intelligence perspective, where they're asking those kinds of questions. Are you 100% sure that at some point in a future technology that an artificial intelligence, a non-biological intelligence, would be able to have a sense of consciousness uh, indistinguishable from our own and not only claim to have self-awareness, because you can program a computer to say, I'm self-aware, why aren't you? I mean, that's easy. But, but really be self-aware. No, I'm not 100% sure. Um, many people are. Yeah, many people are. And I, I can't quite go that far. There's, why? Why can't you well, go there's that an far? Issue, there's, an is, there's an issue here. What's missing? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what's missing. And, and I'm not embarrassed to say that I'm genuinely unsure about what to think in this domain, but that's refreshing. Actually. Yeah, well, let me, <laughs> but let me, let me just, I'll just put my finger on it. There's a word that's missing, and that word is life. Life seems to matter. Hmm. There's something about the kind of autonomous organization that living beings, whether they are cells or simple, simple organisms, have. There's a kind of autonomy and integrity and self-regulation that those things have. And we've never yet been able to have mind or meaning apart from that. Th that's actually interesting because you're not talking about some kind of vitalism. But, and you can have machines that can be programmed to reproduce themselves. I mean, that's easy. The factory is just making other machines. But you're, you're unifying two interesting thoughts, uh, the, the, the idea of machine consciousness and the fact that, that, that life, which is a mm -hmm. physical thing, you know, may have some nexus. And I'm closing the circle on your question about computationalism as well, because one of the great claims made on behalf of the computationalist perspective is that it allows you to extract these questions about mind, consciousness, and cognition from biology. You, could, you can model it all in the software. Right. But what I'm suggesting is that there seems to be something about the organization of living beings which, um, which, which can't be modeled in quite that way. And you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm not a vitalist. I, I have no doubt that what matters for understanding life are functions, many of which we understand very well now, and all of which we understand somewhat. But the, if we want to make progress on the mind, I think the study of mind needs to be richly biological. And computationalism and AI has tended to hold biology at a remove. In fact, a lot of neuroscience holds biology at a remove. They work with, with neural networks, which they model in computers, and then they have very high-level abstract formal pictures of what's really going on in brains. 
My whole point, which I've been trying to come back to in different ways in, in our conversation, is that the brain is part of the body, which is, which is a living organism that is struggling and dynamically interacting with its environment. And we somehow, and I'm just going to not try to pretend I can be too categorical about it, we somehow need to bring that environmental biological story to bear on our understanding of what's going on for us. 